Okay, let's talk about the ramifications of uh, especially the total depravity doctrine, which is Augustinian, but, uh, but also just the idea of inherited guilt. We've already raised some of these points. One is the question of infant damnation. Uh, I've, I've discussed this enough. We don't have to go more into it. I'll just quote what Augustine said on it, which I don't agree with. But uh, in The City of God, Augustine wrote this. Everyone, even little children, have broken God's covenant, not indeed in virtue of any personal action, but in virtue of mankind's common origin in that single ancestor in whom all have sinned. So from what we've said in our first half of this talk, you recognize the language, you recognize the meaning of those words, and you can see that Augustine then did believe that many children, well, that all children are essentially born damned. And therefore he felt that infants needed to be baptized because that would wash away the original sin and then they could go to heaven. Uh, in my understanding of scripture, uh, the Bible does not teach that that original sin is washed away by baptism. It does not teach that infants should be baptized. And it does not teach that infants are damned. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, permit the little children to come to me for of such is the kingdom of heaven, or is the kingdom of God. That is, the kingdom of heaven is consists of what? Little children and those who are like children. He says, if you don't become like them, you won't get there yourself. But in saying that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God consists of this kind of person, well, he certainly doesn't sound like he's saying they're, they're little monsters of iniquity who are damned to hell from birth. Um, it sounds like we get to that stage later in life and it's by returning to being childlike that we can be saved not not by being born you know in sin and so forth now you know uh i love ch spurgeon i don't know if you've read spurgeon but he he was a calvinist augustinian very much that's not what i loved about him uh but uh he was he was a great man a uh, great preacher, but he was, he didn't believe in infant baptism, and he was in arguing, he's arguing with like a congregationalist or somebody who believed in infant baptism on one occasion, and Spurgeon said to the guy, okay, he says, you tell me one scripture that proves infant baptism, and I'll te give you a scripture that proves no infant baptism, and so the, the, uh, the person who believed in infant baptism said, um, Jesus said, permit the little children to come unto me and do not forbid them. And Spurgeon said, okay, now I'll quote my scripture. There was a man from the land of us whose name was Job. And the man said to Spurgeon, that doesn't say anything about baptism. And Spurgeon said, well, neither did your verse. You see, one of the arguments for infant baptism was that Jesus said, let the little children come to me. But to the, to the Peter Baptist, that's someone who believes in infant baptism, to the Peter Baptist, coming to Jesus is being baptized. So saying, let the little children come to me, to them means let the little children be baptized because you come to Jesus by being baptized in their theology. But coming to Jesus isn't by being baptized. There are people who are baptized and they've never really come to Jesus. And there are people who have come to Jesus and have not yet been baptized. It's uh, like, like the household of Cornelius. When the Spirit fell upon them, they had not yet been baptized. They were baptized immediately afterwards. But they hadn't been yet, and they came to Jesus. So coming to Jesus and being baptized is not the same thing. Jesus did say, let the little children come to me. Do not forbid them, because of such is the kingdom of heaven. Sounds like he's saying they're citizens of the kingdom. Until, I would, I would argue, until they reach an age of accountability where they actually sin deliberately, which they all do if they live long enough. Everyone does that. But anyway, this matter of infant damnation is, uh, is one of the issues that is a ramification of this original sin teaching of Augustine. Another ramification is that all men are born haters of God. Now, a scripture on that would be Romans 1.30. Where Paul said, as he is describing, a actually giving a long list of really wicked things. I guess we could start at verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, 
God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, and the rest. Now, this long list of sins and several other long lists of sins in the Bible are sometimes said to prove uh, total depravity and original sin. Well, certainly those things that Paul described do sound like totally depraved people. I, I'm, I won't deny that. I do not deny that there are people who have become totally depraved, but that's just that they have become that way. Paul does not describe their birth condition. It says God gave, because they didn't retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a debased mind, and they became all of this. So he's not describing a person's condition from birth, hating God, although maybe some people do hate God from a very early age. But that's not the point Paul's making. Paul's describing how God has brought judgment on people who had opportunity to know him and rejected that knowledge in their own personal lives, and God gave them over to be basically reprobate. And these descriptions of this horrible sinfulness of them is a description of that reprobation. But obviously it's not their original condition if God had to give them over to it. And so a lot of times scriptures that are used that sound like they work well for the doctrine, when you look at them, they're not really saying that. They may be saying something that sounds like that and something that's not very different than that, but it is something that we have to exegete the passage. Is that really what it's talking about? Now, a very important part of this uh, total depravity, original sin doctrine, especially among Calvinists, is that men are born dead in trespasses and sins. A very important concept for the Calvinists especially. Well, let me say this. The Bible does not say people are born dead in sins. It does say that before we became Christians, we were dead in sins. That's not quite the same statement. To say that I was dead in sins before Christ saved me is not saying exactly the same thing as I was born dead because I might not have been born dead but might have become dead in sins before Christ saved me. Remember, Ephesians and Colossians are the two passages that talk about people being dead in sin. And he's talking about his readers. They were dead in sin and Christ made them alive. However, these were all adult converts. Paul had planted these churches only a few years earlier. The people who were Christians in those towns had been grown-ups. They heard the gospel and became saved. They were pagans before that. They were indeed dead. But in Colossians 2.12, he describes, he said that we were buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So it says you were dead in trespasses, but Christ, of course, by regeneration, has made you alive. Uh, in, Col in Ephesians 2, the opening verses in Ephesians 2 says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we also once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. So we were dead in trespasses, but God made us alive. Okay, good doctrine. We were all dead in sins. At least all of us who are like the readers who were saved as adults. Uh, if a person was saved in, in childhood, it's hard to say. Remember, Paul said in Romans 7, I was alive until the commandment came. Then it slew me. Paul acknowledges he was dead in sin before he came to Christ. But he wasn't born that way. Before he was dead, he was alive. I believe before he reached the age of accountability, he was alive, but then he, the commandment came, sin revived, and it slew him. So he's dead. And then Christ made him alive when he was saved. So I don't know that Paul can be made to say that people are born dead in sins. He just says that his readers had been, in fact, dead in sins. But even if we say that they were born dead in sins, what does that mean, dead? To the Calvinists, that means, that proves you can't, without being first regenerated, you can't come to Christ. You can't repent, you can't believe, you can't do anything because you're dead. Dead people can't do those things. 
And so that's why they say, if you're totally depraved and you're dead in sins, that God has to make you alive first. And then when you're alive, you can believe and repent because dead people can't do that. And so they argue that regeneration must be before faith. This is a key element between Calvinism and non-Calvinism theology. Calvinism says regeneration comes before faith. Non-Calvinist theology says, no, faith comes before regeneration. In fact, faith is the cause of regeneration or is the, is the condition of regeneration. Regeneration is the result of faith. That's non-Calvinism. Calvinism says, no. You can't have people regenerated because they had faith, because they were dead. They couldn't have faith, so they have to be regenerated first, then they can have faith. Now, that's because of their particular doctrine of total depravity. People are dead, and dead means you can't believe. You can't repent. But what do we mean dead? What does Paul mean dead? He doesn't mean physically dead, certainly, because people before they were saved were not physically dead. It's a metaphor. But what kind of a metaphor is it? It's obvious that the Calvinist is using it to mean a dead person cannot do certain things. So dead means unable. It's speaking of the inability. But wait a minute. If people are spiritually dead before they're saved, and that means they have the same inabilities that dead people do, how do they get up in the morning? How do they brush their teeth? How do they go to work? How do they drive down the street? How do they get married? How do they have children? If they're dead, dead people don't do any of those things. If the word dead is speaking of inability, that before, you know, we were dead, so we couldn't believe because dead people can't believe. We couldn't repent. Well, we couldn't do anything else either if we're really literally dead. Obviously, if we're going to say dead in sin is speaking of certain kinds of inabilities, where do we put the perimeters around what that metaphor refers to? It's artificial to say, well, it just means we couldn't believe and repent. Well, where does Paul say that? The truth is, one man who was said to be dead in the Bible did repent, and that was the prodigal son. The prodigal son was away from his father in a far country. Things went badly for him. He said, I'm going to rise and go to my father, and I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your servants. So he decided to get up and leave. He started home. His father intercepted him and says, My son was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. The prodigal son away from his father is a classic case in Scripture that Jesus says was dead. But in what sense was he dead? He, he, he made a decision to come home. Being dead in that metaphorical sense apparently doesn't mean you can't repent, because he did. What does it mean? It's not talking about the inability of a dead person. It's talking about the status or of a person in relationship to their father. He was dead to his father. He was gone out of his father's life. We were dead in our, toward God. Our sins slew us. The commandment caused sin to revive and it slew us and and as far as our relationship with, with God was concerned we were dead but that doesn't mean we were literally dead and couldn't do anything about it unbelievers all the time are, are found to repent and come to Christ thousands of people did today somewhere in the world they were dead now they're alive and it does now the Calvinist says well but they had to be regenerated first well I'm going to have to see some scripture for that before you tell me that's true because I don't think that's in the scripture I never read in the Bible of people being raised from the dead and then believing, or coming to life and then believing, having eternal life and then believing, or being born again and then believing. I read in every case, you are born again by believing. You believe so that you might have life, is, is the common phrase in Scripture. That's what John said at the end of his Gospel. He says, these things are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ, and that through believing you might have life oh okay so you believe first then you have life next you don't get the life before you believe when when jesus told nicodemus you have to be born again nicodemus said well how can how can a man be born again Jesus said well when moses raised up a serpent on the uh, you know in in the wilderness so also the son of man will be lifted up so whoever believes in him will have everlasting life whoever believes will have life, will come to life. Believing is what brings that regeneration to us. And there's everything in the Bible that talks about it says the same thing. There's never a passage anywhere that says it the opposite way. Look at Colossians 2, which is, we were there just a moment ago. This is a great verse on this very point of 
What's first, regeneration or faith? It says in verse 13, You being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive. That's regeneration, right? He's brought you to life. You were dead. You're born again. He has made alive with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. That is, he brought you to life, having already forgiven you. That the, 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 the verb tense there insists that the forgiveness came before the life. But how is a person forgiven? We're justified by faith, are we not? When you believe in God, you're justified, you're forgiven. So, and then as a result, God brings you to life. Paul says that you were dead, God brought you to life, having forgiven you. That means having previously forgiven you. The faith and justification came before the regeneration. And you won't find a scripture that gives it otherwise. It's, it's always in that order. So it seems to me that to say that all men who are not regenerated are necessarily are haters of God, they're dead in such a way that they cannot repent. This is, uh, these are you know, theological musings of Augustine, but they're not statements of scripture. Now, of course, if man has a sinful nature and Jesus became a man, did Jesus have a sinful nature? This is a theological thing that's been debated, but after all, if it's, if it's part of being a man that you have sinful nature, did Jesus have one or not? Augustine had to wrestle with that because you know he did believe in original sin, but he didn't believe Jesus had that, yet he believed Jesus was a man. And Actually, this is from Augustine in a letter he wrote. He said, if the souls of all men are derived from that one which was breathed into the first man, either the soul of Christ was not derived from that one since he had no sin of any kind, or if his soul was derived from that first one, he purified it in taking it for himself so that he might be born of the virgin and might come to us without any trace of sin, either committed or transmitted. Now, you can just see here that Augustine is wrestling with this question. If man has this original sin and Christ is a man, how do we explain him not having it? Well, either, either he didn't inherit it, his soul from Adam, or else he did and something about him taking it on purified it. Well, obviously one of these things could be true, but there's nothing in the Bible that, that makes any of those points. He's wrestling, as we all do, to try to make all the theological points we embrace consistent with each other. And this is one where he had a little bit of trouble knowing what to say about it. Now, what the Roman Catholic Church has said is that Jesus did not, he was born without the taint of original sin because his mother didn't have it and he didn't have a father. Now, how did his mother not have it? She was human. Well, this is the doctrine of the immaculate conception, not the virgin birth. Catholics usually know this, but Protestants sometimes don't. When the Catholics speak of the Immaculate Conception, they're not talking about the virgin birth. The virgin birth is the biblical doctrine that Jesus was born of a virgin. The Immaculate Conception is not talking about Jesus, it's talking about Mary when she was born, more probably when she was conceived in her mother's womb. Her conception was immaculate, clean. They teach that God did a miracle to preserve Mary from inheriting original sin from her father so that she was sinless before Jesus was. And that's why Jesus didn't inherit original sin because his mother didn't have it and his dad, God, didn't have it. So Jesus was, the, uh, you know, was born without it. But you see, in order to get there, they make Mary sinless before they make Jesus sinless. You know, they had to make her free from sin and then they had to have some miracle in her mother's womb when her dad and mom were having sex, God had to do something to prevent the dad, Mary's dad, from transmitting the original sin to her. And nothing in the, in the Bible at all would support any of that. But you see, this is the way they wrestle. If there's original sin in humanity, didn't Jesus come through Adam's line? Isn't he descended from Adam? How'd this not happen? Now, most Protestants who don't believe in the Immaculate Conception of Mary usually will say, well, here's what it is. You get the sin nature from your father's side, not your mother. Now, Mary, they would say, Protestants would say, Mary was, had sin. She wasn't immaculate. She was like other human beings, sinful. But she couldn't pass the sin nature down to Jesus because it doesn't come from the mother, it comes from the father. And his father was God. He didn't have a sinful father, so Jesus was born without sin nature. All of these ingenious guesses. All I can say is one of these things may be true. 
They're probably not all true, but, but you know, one of these explanations might in fact be true. The one thing they have in common is none of them are taught in the Bible. So they're all guesses. The Bible does not say anywhere that the sin nature is passed down through the man. In fact, there's nothing in the Bible that speaks specifically of the sin nature passed down at all. We are told that we all sinned in Adam, or through Adam sin came. That's really what we're told. Sin came into the world through Adam. But it doesn't, in Genesis chapter 3, where this first sin took place, the first sin, which is really supposed to be the basis of all doctrines of original sin, was when Adam and Eve sinned. Actually, Eve committed the original sin because she did it before Adam. But it's Adam who's always blamed in the New Testament for being the one who brings sin into the world. But they both did. But you see, they were both called Adam. Did you know that? In Genesis chapter 5, <clears throat> the New King James uh, obscures this a little bit, but in the King James it's rendered quite correctly. In Genesis 5, 1, it says, uh, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them Adam. Actually, the New King James says he called them mankind. The truth is the word Adam means man. So it could be mankind. But in the Hebrew, and the King James brings this out, he made man and woman called them Adam. Just like husbands and wives have the same name. When a person becomes a wife, she takes her husband's name. Uh, And so Eve was a different person than Adam, but she shared his name, his identity. So to say we that in Adam, sin came into the world. Well, Adam is Adam and Eve. They're both called Adam together. Uh, but in any case, when you read about the fall in Genesis 3, when God says what the consequences of the fall will be, before they sinned, he said, in the day you eat of it, you'll die. Okay. After they ate of it, he said, okay, you're going to have childbearing problems. You're going to have problems with farming. You're going to eat your bread in the sweat of your face. There's going to be this conflict between you and the seed of the serpent. End of discussion. Well, but where's the part about you're going to pass down this guilt to your offspring? You don't get it. God, at the very time when he's talking about the consequences of the fall, doesn't mention anything about the offspring, except that the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent will be in conflict with each other, but that's not quite the same thing. That's not the same point. So, you don't really find out about anything about original sin very clearly until you get to Romans 5 where it says through Adam's sin entered the world in what sense did it enter the world maybe historically there wasn't sin in the world before Adam's sin uh, but all die how do we all die well we all die Paul said because all have sinned but why do we all sin did we inherit this from Adam or do we just sin because you know what Pelagius taught, and I don't, I don't agree with Pelagius about this particularly, but Pelagius taught that every baby born since Adam was born like Adam was created. Innocent, with a free will, and every person made the same mistake Adam did. To my mind, that sounds almost just too coincidental. You know, there's only been about you know, 12 billion people who have lived and died. Every single one of them made the same mistake. Wasn't there a smart one in the bunch? You know, what, what is it? <laughs> What is it that made every single person who died, born after him fall? It certainly had something to do with that connection, something to do with what happened in the Garden of Eden. But what exactly? There's very, very little in the Bible that answers that question. In fact, there may be nothing that answers it directly, but we're going to explore that scripturally. First of all, is there a biblical basis to believe that we are born inclined towards sin? I think there is. Um, I've given you some verses in your notes. In Proverbs 22:15, it says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child. The rod of reproof will drive it from him. Now, to Solomon, foolishness isn't just being stupid. Foolishness is evil. In the Proverbs, the contrast between the wise and the fool is a contrast between the righteous and the unrighteous. Throughout Proverbs, the wise man is the one who fears God and obeys God. The fool is the one who doesn't do those things. In Proverbs, foolishness always has a moral component. Foolishness is always sinful in Proverbs. So to say foolishness was bound up in the heart of a child sounds like it's saying that children are born with foolishness in them, or which would be sinful. Now, 
I have to say there's a, this particular scripture as a proof text has a weakness, maybe two weaknesses. One, it doesn't say in a baby, only in a child. So it, it doesn't say for sure that the baby was born this way. A child might have acquired it just by, by doing bad things. He be, forms bad habits for all the scripture in that place says. We don't know. Solomon could have believed that children are born that way or that they came to be that way somehow after they committed their first sins in childhood. We don't know. But he said in, in a child, foolishness bound up in their heart. But what's, what's more problematic is that the next line says, the rod will drive it out of them. <laughs> now, the problem is not that, that, people, that children can be improved by discipline. The problem is if, the, if we're talking about a sinful nature, can you drive that out of someone with a stick? You know, isn't that, don't we like need super, hey, if you can drive my sinful nature out of me with a stick, please have at it, because I'd like to have it gone. But, you know, that verse doesn't necessarily, I, I don't know, I think he may be saying in that verse, not what, not what, uh, anything about a sinful nature so much as that children tend to be foolish, but you can wise them up with a stick, you know. Anyway, this is a verse that might be used to support that, uh, you know, children are born with a sin nature. Uh, maybe a little better is this one, uh, John eight thirty four. Jesus said, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Now, he could be saying, after you commit your first sin, you become a slave of sin, but it could also mean you commit sin because you're a slave of sin. You ever heard preachers kind of raise this issue? You don't, you're not a sinner because you sin, you sin because you're a sinner. You ever heard that difference? Yeah. Well, I'm not really sure which of those statements is really true, but it's very common to say you, the reason you sin is because you're born a sinner. Okay, that's probably true. But, uh, and, and therefore, to say whoever sins is a slave of sin would just be a way of saying by sinning you show that you are, in fact, a sinner, a slave of sin. Uh, though it could be, uh, I suppose, uh, taken the other way. I, in, in Romans 6, Paul talks about being slaves of sin also. And I take slave of sin to mean a slave it, it takes orders from his master. A, a master of a slave dictates the behavior of the slave. So if my master is sin, then sin is going to be dictating my behavior. And I'm a slave. I can't help it. I, I mean, I'm, I'm trapped here. And so that would be a pretty good argument uh, if, if that's what it means. In Romans 6, verses uh, 16 and following, I gave you 16 through 23, but we don't have to read that many verses. But it says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Now, a slave of sin. If we were born slaves of sin, then I'd say we were born with the inevitability of sinning, inevitable sinful nature. Sin was driving us. Sin's controlling us. Of course, he says, now we're slaves of righteousness. And I don't always do the right thing, though I'm a slave of righteousness. Uh, it's not Righteousness doesn't always dictate my behavior. Hopefully it does most of the time. But to say I'm a slave of righteousness doesn't predict that I'll, all, everything I will ever do will be a righteous thing. So also being a slave of sin may not predict that everything a person does is sinful, but that they are living on a course of sin that they cannot break free from. I believe that is the case with all people who are not saved. And unfortunately, too much so for people who are saved as well if they don't walk in the Spirit, as Paul pointed out in Romans 7. You know, I don't know, I don't understand what I do. I will to do good, but I do the wrong thing. And there's, he talks about there's sin in my members. Uh, he, he uses that expression in Romans 7. In the discussion in Romans 7, verses 14 through 25, I've got sin in my members, Paul says. I, I can will to do good, but how to do the good that I want to do, I can't find because there's another law in my members that brings me into bondage to sin. So I think that's a pretty strong statement of a sinful nature. In my members, there's this law that makes me a slave of sin, even when I want to do what's right. It does sound like 
we're not just neutral creatures who can just as easily choose right or wrong. Choosing wrong is more easy than choosing right. I think everyone knows that human beings, from the time they're born, it's easier to be selfish than to be unselfish. Is it not? Isn't that the, the struggle that all human beings who endeavor to engage it find? That when you want to be selfless, you've still got that tendency to be selfish. Now, it may be, we could say, well, that's an acquired habit from doing the wrong thing when you're young. Well, no, I think babies are born pretty selfish. Babies are born not caring how inconvenient they are in the middle of the night or, you know, that those who have to change their diapers or whatever, you know. I mean, let's face it, babies are very inconvenient to their mothers initially. I mean, because mothers get up and nurse the baby at the night and there's the dirty diapers and all this lost sleep and so forth. The baby doesn't care about that. All the baby cares about is what it wants. That's selfish. Now, I don't blame the baby for that. It doesn't know about any better, but its nature seems to be selfish. And uh, if it's easier to be selfish than to be unselfish that, by nature, it sounds like there's something in our nature that inclines us towards sin. In Ephesians 2, we read a moment ago, in Ephesians 2, verses 2 and 3, Paul said we were by nature children of wrath. He didn't say we, it was that we had become children of wrath, but by nature we we're children of wrath. What's that mean, though? What's children of wrath mean? Well, the phrase, it's a Hebraism, it would mean people who are destined, uh, unless something changes, to experience the wrath of God. And uh, this doesn't tell us whether there's inherited guilt or not, but by nature we were the type of people that would bring wrath upon themselves if we don't get saved and repent. So it sounds like Paul believes there's a natural sinfulness in man. And um, now this one is a, not as good. This is Ephesians 4. This one is one that is used often by Calvinists to prove total depravity, but it, it doesn't really work as well. But it's a, since it's popular, I'll bring it up. <clears throat> In Ephesians 4, 17 and following, Paul says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now, that certainly describes a pretty depraved state. But it's hard to argue that this is a birth condition since it says they have given themselves over to be this way. That they are past feeling suggests that they used to have feeling, but they're past that point now. So he's described an, uh, people in an advanced stage of depravity, not necessarily a description of the way they were born. It, they may have been born that way, but he doesn't say so. So we can't prove anything by that. So it looks to me like there's some scriptural evidence... And perhaps every case that I gave could be disputed, but I don't know that there's any real reason to, to want to or need to. Uh, it's not a lot of scriptural testimony, by the way. For an important doctrine like that, you'd expect more, but there's some, some indication that people are born with a sinful nature, or at least born more inclined to be sinful than to be righteous, more inclined to be selfish than to be selfless. Uh, now, what about the inheriting... Uh, this nature from birth. Not much there, but there's a little bit. Um, Seth was born in the likeness and image of Adam after he fell. In Genesis 5, 1 through 3, verse 1 says that Adam was made in the image and likeness of God. But then, of course, we know Adam fell. And by the time Seth was born, it says Adam begat a son in his own likeness and his own image. Interesting. Adam was in the image and likeness of God. Seth was in the image and likeness of Adam. And by this time, Adam had fallen and was a sinner. So many people feel this shows that people are born after the fall like Adam, sinful. And that could mean that. Although, I, I mean, just to be fair-minded, it's not clear that it means that that's how he was like Adam. There's no mention in that particular verse of the fallenness of Adam, though we know Technically, he had fallen at that time. It might be that it was eye, his eye color or the shape of his body or something that was in the likeness of Adam. It doesn't say specifically that it was the sinfulness of Adam that, that, uh, that Seth resembled. Though it could be. Uh, we've got this business. Remember I talked about how the in Genesis 6-5 about the condition of people before the flood? Well, after the flood, 
In Genesis 8, 21, God says that the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Now, it doesn't say from birth, and you can certainly find youths who are very evil, who, who may or may not have been that bad when they were born. But it is suggested that this may be saying that people are born pretty much wicked. Their heart is inclined toward evil from their youth. Now, to look at the verse fairly in its context, What it says in Genesis 8.21 is the Lord smelled the soothing aroma after the flood when Adam, I mean when Noah uh, offered the sacrifice. It says, Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I've done. This although might mean even if. The, The phrase could mean I'm not going to destroy the earth like I did in the flood even if a man's wickedness is from his youth ingrained. But, I, but I'm, I'm not going to, you know, be concerned about those small points. I think there's a strong indication here that people are bad from their early youth and very possibly because of a birth condition. Um, I already mentioned Psalm 51.5 where David said, In sin my mother conceived me. Well, that could be saying that when I was conceived, I was conceived in the realm of sin. I was under the bondage of sin, in the grip of sin, and therefore I was born of the sinful nature. That certainly is a possible meaning of it. I don't know if it's the most intuitive meaning of it or the most likely meaning of it, but it cannot be argued that it isn't a possible meaning of it. It could could be. And then, of course, here's one that is often used, but it's got its problems too. All the verses that we use have their own problems in being used for that particular to make that particular point because in Psalm uh, 58 3 it says the wicked are estranged from the womb now there sounds like a good that's a great line that's a great line for talking about being born that way the wicked are estranged from the womb but it says they go astray as soon as they're born speaking lies now I never saw a baby born speaking lies babies I I had five babies and none of them spoke a word much less any lies when they were born. They did later. But this is hyperbole. What he's saying is the wicked are, they're just so perennially wicked, going astray, speaking lies, it's like they're born that way. But really, no one is really born going anywhere. Babies don't go astray because they don't go anywhere. They don't speak lies because they don't speak. And therefore, we have this is poetry. And that's something we have to be careful when we use psalms for doctrine, they can be used for doctrine. But we have to be very careful that we recognize when they're speaking poetically. And it seems to me if he hadn't said anything about them speaking lies from birth, I wouldn't necessarily know if it was hyperbole. I might think, yeah, this could be a very good argument for being born with a sinful nature. And it may even be still. But it's it's got its, like I said, all these verses that seem to talk about inheriting the sinful nature yeah, they kind of have something about them that sound like they could say that. But they also, all of them have something about them that, well, you know, it has this element in it that doesn't quite say that. But we can say this. I think we've all observed that children are born with a sinful nature. You know, even if the Bible didn't have any definitive statements about it, I think we'd have something to explain when we see every darn baby is born selfish. Why? Why can't they be born like baby Jesus <laughs> oh haven't you read that hint, uh, that Christmas carol the poor baby wakes but little Lord Jesus no crying he makes don't you know he never cried as a baby <laughs> that's a song that's not Bible I think he did cry as a baby as a matter of fact but but the truth is babies do selfish things right from the beginning and I'm inclined I wouldn't press it on everyone but I'd, I'm inclined to say that this is a birth tendency towards sin and uh, so I would be inclined at least to agree with Irenaeus and with the doctrines perhaps of uh, maybe the Roman Catholics and the Episcopalians and some others uh, Methodists and some others hold that children are born with a sin nature but not necessarily with the guilt of Adam to answer for when they're born Now, what about Adam's guilt? There is evidence in Scripture that God does not blame children for their father's sins. 
In Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 16, the law was given, a, a son shall not be put to death for his father's sin. And in Jeremiah chapter 31, <clears throat> verses 29 and 30, it says, In those days they shall no more say, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. This statement, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and his teeth are set on edge, is quoted here. It's also found in uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, this saying. It was a proverb among the Jews uh, just before the exile. And both Jeremiah and Ezekiel got sick of hearing people say it and said, don't say that anymore. Don't say the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. You may think, what in the world is that even saying? What it's saying is, it's a proverb, but in the natural course of events, usually the person who eats the sour grapes is the one who grimaces. If you eat, bite into something that's more sour than that, you know, your teeth are set on edge. That's the idea. The idea, though, is uh, this time it's our fathers who ate the sour grapes and we're the ones who are grimacing. The implication is our fathers did the sinning and we're paying the price for it. And Jeremiah and Ezekiel both say, don't talk like that. Because you're not dying for your father's sins. You're dying for your own sins. And uh, it does seem, that, and, and by the way, Ezekiel 18.20 says the same thing. It does seem that a, a father's sins are not held uh, against a child. Look at one other place. 1 Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings 14. In verses 12 and 13, this is talking about a child that was sick who was the son of a very wicked king. The king was under God's judgment. The, the child was sick. But it says, The prophet said to the child's mother, Arise therefore and go to your own house. When your feet enter the city, your child will die, and all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he is the only one of Jeroboam who shall come to the grave, because in him there is found something good toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Now, it's interesting because you'd say, wait a minute, he's going to die because God found something good in him? No, he's going to die because he's sick, but he's going to have a, a decent burial. He's the only one in Jeroboam's family who's going to have a decent burial. The others are going to be eaten by, by vultures and dogs. Uh, they're going to be subjected to indignity because they are so wicked. The point here is the child, though he's a child of wicked Jeroboam, is still not going to suffer the same fate. After all, a child who dies... Is, hasn't gone anywhere that's undesirable if they go to heaven. So uh, it would seem that though his father was wicked, he God saw something good in the child and did not impute the father's wickedness to him. Now, there is such a thing as children suffering consequences for their father's sins but not being held responsible for them. For example, when God said in, his, in uh, Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, I'm a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Now, this is not talking about imputed sin. After all, if it was, it should be beyond the third and fourth generation. If we are suffering from Adam's sin and God's holding that against us, then that's like a gazillion generations ago. He says, I will visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. What he's talking about there in the context is it's in the second commandment don't make idols, don't worship idols. And he says, because I'm jealous and I'll visit your iniquity on you to your on the fathers to the third and fourth generation of the children. He's saying that if Israel breaks the covenant and worships idols instead of worshiping God, God will judge Israel in such a way that the children who didn't worship the idols will still suffer consequences. And they did when they went into Babylonian captivity. It was because of idolatry that God sent the Jews into Babylon for 70 years. A, a generation of youth went in because of their parents' sins. They grew up and had kids. They grew up and had kids. They were all in captivity. Now, did God send them to hell? No, he didn't hold them accountable for their father's sins. They just were suffering the consequences. Just like if you have a father who's a gambler and he wastes all the family money, the children live in poverty. You know, the children suffer for what their father does, but God doesn't hold it against them. A baby that's born to a crack addict might be a crack baby. It's suffering. 
for its mother's sins, but it's not guilty of its mother's sins. You see, the Bible does make it very clear. We all suffer from the sins of other people. And many times the sins of the people, it's our parents' sins that we suffer from. But that's a different thing than saying that God holds us accountable for what they did. And, for example, all the firstborn of Egypt were killed at the night of the Passover. That must have included some children, probably innocent children. It was a judgment on their parents for their parents' sins. The children, I assume, went to heaven. They suffered death because of their parents' wickedness. The Canaanite children suffered death because their parents were so wicked. The Amalekite children did. David's son died because of David and Bathsheba's sin. They died and went to heaven. God didn't hold it against those children, but they suffered in this life circumstances that were brought on by the sins of their parents. Just like you might, if you go home and, and someone has robbed your house, well, you've suffered because of their sin, but you're not responsible for it. And likewise, a child whose parents bring disaster on the family, even death on the family, that child's not guilty of his father's sins, but he suffered for it. And there is such a thing as suffering the consequences. But there's no scripture that specifically affirms inherited guilt. Once again, the two passages used most often are those of uh, Psalm 51.5, In sin my mother conceived me, which, you know, if, you know, you, I think you need something clearer than that to make such a radical statement as every baby is guilty for what Adam did. I mean, that's a radical statement, certainly counterintuitive, and you'd need some specific statement of Scripture that said it clearly rather than one that could be taken two or three different ways. At least, if, at least I would need something better than that. The fact that Augustine said it means that doesn't, doesn't ring my chimes. I, you know, I, I'm not a follower of Augustine. I'd like to see what scriptural case he makes, and when I see it, I'm not impressed. The other one is, very, is of course, Romans 5, 12, which we mentioned at the very beginning. And this is the main verse that is used for inherited uh, guilt. But does it say that? Romans 5, 12, we saw it earlier. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Now again, does this mean all sinned in Adam or all sinned individually? The phrase can mean either one. But he says death spread to all men because all sin. Sin and death as a result came out through Adam. So what does this mean? Well, it might mean what the doctrine of original sin says. It might mean that when Adam sinned, something marked the human race in such a way that every child born of Adam and every grandchild, great-grandchild, and so forth, are marked with this consequence, whatever it is, whether it's guilt or sinful nature or something else. Adam did something that we inherited from him. And it could mean that. But just in all honesty, it doesn't say that. It says sin came into the world through Adam and death came into the world through Adam. What that really means is that before Adam, and certainly before his sin, there was no death. Before his sin, there was no sin. Human history saw the entrance of sin and death through Adam. But the question is, what, how does that affect me or you? And, and that's what has to be taken in the next phrase is does he say we inherited this or is there some other thing that he means by this he says sin entered through Adam death through sin okay so history these things were introduced in human history through Adam's behavior okay and thus or in this way death spread to all men because all sin in what way could he be saying the world fought, saw its first sin through Adam, and as a result, death. And in the same way, what? People sin and they die. Death spread to all of us because we all sin, in the same way as it happened to Adam. There's, it, this could be true whether or not we've inherited it from Adam. I mean, uh, the, the statement would be true without that assumption. Now, I'm not arguing we didn't inherit it from Adam, because I don't know. There's just not much there. This is the verse that mainly is said to prove it. And it doesn't say much about it. Now, it is true, we have to explain somehow how that all do sin. 
and all do die. Now, Calvinists argue the reason babies die is because of original sin. They don't die for any sin they committed, but they, but they say uh, death is a penal result of sinning. And since babies die who have not sinned, they must die for the penalty for someone else's sin. It must be Adam. That's what Calvinists say. But is there any other way to look at this? Let, let me, I don't know the answer. Don't think I'm here promoting something one way or the other about this, but I, I, I've given this a lot of thought. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of verses of Scripture that definitively tell us how to think about it. So there's some other possible ways that we could consider it. Here's one way. We need to ask, why do I die because of what Adam did? That's really the question. Why do babies die because of what Adam did? Why did Adam have this impact on us all? What, what is the means of transmission of this problem? Is it genetic? Is there a gene for sin? Is there a gene for death? How did we inherit something from our parents that results in sin and death? Well, there is a, you know, here's a, a possible, a possible alternative. And this is not something that I know to be the case. It's just something else to put in your mind to think about and see if that works biblically too. First point would be man was created potentially immortal, but also potentially mortal. Man was not made immortal. The Bible tells us that in, in 1 Timothy 6, 16, where it says, God alone possesses immortality. Now the word alone is emphatic. God, and only God, possesses immortality. Now, if words mean anything, it means that anyone other than God doesn't possess immortality. That is, immortality is not a natural human trait. And we see that when Adam was told, if you eat this fruit of the tree of the knowledge of evil, you're going to die. He actually said, in, he says, in the day you eat of it, you'll surely die, is how we understand it. And uh, some people say, well, Adam didn't die that day. He lived another 930 years after that, so it must mean spiritual death. Well, maybe it does. But actually, in the Hebrew, it says, in the day you eat of it, dying you shall die. Dying you shall die is how it reads in the Hebrew. Now, could that mean that as long as you're in the garden eating of the tree of life, you'll never die? But if you eat of this other tree, I'm going to cut you off from the tree of life, and then you're going to start dying. From that day on, dying, you will ultimately die. Death will become your destiny because you will be cut off from the one thing that could have kept you alive, the tree of life. You remember that when, when they sinned, God said, lest they reach out and take of the tree of life and live forever. I'm putting a cherub there to guard the way so they don't go there. Now, if man was made immortal anyway, why would he have to eat the tree of life to have, live forever? It would be part of human nature to be immortal. But only God possesses immortality, but he shares it with those who are faithful to him. He, we, we have eternal life in Christ, the Bible says. The Bible says that God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Immortality is a gift from faith in Christ. Otherwise, people perish, the Bible says. And it says it not just in that famous verse, in verse after verse after verse after verse in Scripture. And when God said to Adam, if you eat it, the day you eat of it, dying you shall die. Let me, let me suggest to you a, a scenario that might be the case. When God made Adam, he had no intrinsic immortality, but he was potentially immortal, just like all people are potentially immortal. If they come to Christ, They'll receive eternal life. Otherwise, they perish. If Adam had remained faithful to God, he could keep eating of the tree of life continually and live forever. This was his privilege, un unless he sinned. But if he sinned, he'd be cut off from that tree of life, and then there'd be nothing to prolong his life forever. He would just begin to die and eventually actually die. If that is true, and that seems to be agreeable with the language of Genesis and of frankly, other scripture, the wages of sin is death, then one could argue this, that man who was born outside the Garden of Eden was born alienated from God and separated from the tree of life. Now, of course, Revelation says that the tree of life is going to be found again in the New Jerusalem. In Revelation 22, 3, it says the tree of life is there. And it produces its fruit 12 times a year, it says. 
Now you see that if it produces fruit 12 times a year, it must be something you eat of regularly, at least repeatedly. If just eating of the tree of life one time just confers eternal life, you never have to eat it again. Why, why in eternity would it produce 12 times a year? Obviously, it's to be eaten of on a regular basis. I think that could be symbolic in Revelation, but it, whether it is or not, it speaks of drawing upon the life and immortality of God continually. And the tree of life in the garden would have allowed Adam and Eve to do that. But their sin has made them rebels against God. They lost that privilege, and they were potentially immortal, but they didn't get to continue in that because the tree was banished from them. They were banished from it. And everyone who's born from them since has been born alienated from the tree of life. We're not in the garden anymore. You and I are born like Adam after his fall. was. Uh, we have no access to that tree of life. We all die physically. But there is immortality offered to us in Christ. He's the new tree of life for us. But the reason people die, even babies who are innocent, is not necessarily because God's judging them individually. All oh, that baby is, I'm angry at him, I'm going to kill that baby. I believe they die because like we're born we don't have access to the tree of life from birth the tree of life is what would have kept Adam and Eve alive forever but God said nope not anymore and so death would pass on all men even if there was not this guilt passed on hereditarily to us from Adam simply by the fact that we're born outside the garden the tree of life is not accessible to us we're going to die what else is there to do if you don't have eternal life but die it's the human race is mortal and only Christ, only faith in Christ can impart immortality to us. Look what Romans chapter 2 says. Um, Paul's talking about ultimate destinies of the wicked and of the righteous, but it says in verse 5, but in accordance with your hardness of your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. That's us, folks, the followers of Jesus. He's going to grant, on the day of judgment, he's going to grant eternal life to those who spend their life seeking what? among other things, seeking immortality. Well, if we're naturally immortal, why would we have to seek for that? That's something that only is obtained by seeking it. In Christ, we are alive in Christ. We are saved in Christ. We are righteous in Christ. We've been born again and are seated in heavenly places with Christ. In Christ, we have eternal life because he has it. But if we weren't in him, we wouldn't have it. It says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son he that has the son has life he that has not the son of God does not have the life so the reason people die is because people are mortal and being mortal itself is not a result of the fall Adam was mortal but potentially immortal his life was sustained or was to be sustained forever by eating the tree of life but his natural state would not sustain him forever without that the reason everybody sins then and dies is because Adam's choice knocked us out of the garden. And out of the garden means away from the tree of life, so we die, and away from God. Because the garden was the place of fellowship between God and man. Adam was banished from the garden and alienated from God. People are born alienated from God. Now, I believe, let me, let me suggest something to you. When we talk about a sinful nature, what are we really talking about? The tendency to sin, Okay. What is sin? Sin is pleasing ourselves instead of pleasing God, isn't it? Isn't it doing what we want instead of what God wants? Now, what makes us want things? Well, some things we want are merely biological. If you don't eat enough food, you get hungry. You want food. If uh, Most people, if they're abstinent from sex long enough, they, they have a, a desire for sex. If you don't drink enough, you want to drink water. If you don't sleep enough, you want to sleep. There's, there's these drives, this human condition glands and biological systems make us crave food and sex and drink and sleep and those things that God built into us in the right place are not sin it's not a sin to eat food or have sex or drink or, or sleep if you're doing it with the right parties and in the right 
way, you know. But you can sin in all those ways. You can be a glutton. You can be a drunkard. You could be a fornicator. You could be a, a sluggard. In other words, if you let your natural drives rule you, that is, if you don't govern them by the power that God gives you in a relationship with him, you're just a slave of your drives. You're, you're, you're going to live in sin because your drives are going to be indiscriminate. There, you know, you can only not sin by having a relationship with God because God gives you the, the grace. God's spirit gives you the power to resist the flesh. Remember when Paul said, I want to do what's right, but this law in my members brings me into bondage to sin. He says, what can I do? He says, well, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord because he says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That's in Romans 8, 2. And he said that the righteous requirements of the law are fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. In other words, the spirit of God enables us to overcome the power of the flesh moment by moment as we walk with him. It's only in a relationship with God that you have a power beyond yourself to overcome the indiscriminate lusts of your flesh that will lead you to sin. You have a tendency to want to please yourself and you've got all these drives. And if you don't govern that from the Spirit of God, from a relationship with God, there's nothing for it but for you to be sinning. You can't not sin because you can't not please yourself unless you have something stronger than yourself, the Spirit of God, over, overpowering that sinful self. Paul said in, in Galatians 5, uh, 16, he said, this I say, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh are in themselves not always wrong. If I want to eat, that can be a wrong thing or a right thing de depending on the circumstances. Maybe I'm supposed to be fasting. Maybe the only food I'm craving is somebody else's food and I don't, I, I don't own it. I shouldn't steal it. But eat it, the desire to eat is not itself sinful, but it can lead me to sin unless I have a relationship with God that says, okay, no, this, in this case I shouldn't eat, I shouldn't eat that. I, I, you know, uh, I shouldn't have sex with that person. I shouldn't sleep too long because I have responsibilities. I sh you know, these things I would naturally want to do have to be governed by my conscience and by my principles, which can't, can't overcome my fleshly desires unless God's Spirit does it in me. In other words, yeah, I am born prone to sin. But I don't know if there's some kind of an ontological stuff called sin that got passed down through the bloodline, or if it's just that as a son of Adam, alienated from God by birth and alienated from the tree of life, there's no options but to sin and to die as a consequence of sinning. You might say, well, I don't understand the difference between that and any other thing we've talked about here. Neither do I exactly. Uh, all I'm saying is that there is great, great discussion among theologians about how sin is passed down, as if sin is a like a, a virus that got you know Adam got infected with this virus and it, you know, we all inherit it like like AIDS or something. You know, that may be. The Bible doesn't clarify that. It's not a very. There's no clear description in the Bible of why it is that Adam's sin has resulted in all of the rest of us sinning. And it may be that there is a virus of some sort, though the Bible's not clear on that. It may be simply that Adam being thrown out of the garden meant that all his offspring are living outside the garden too. And outside the garden, there's no tree of life. Outside the garden, God isn't in fellowship with us. We got just our own fleshly desires to wrestle with, and we can't defeat ourselves because we're not stronger than ourselves. We need God. We need life in Christ. We'll have immortality. We need the power of the Holy Spirit or we'll be governed by sin. And that's what the New Testament says that salvation offers us. Life in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome sin. Whether you explain original sin in an Augustinian way or the way Irenaeus did or in the way, even if you, even if you hold views like Pelagius, to expound any of those views, you have to go beyond what the Bible specifically says. These are all philosophical attempts to make sense of reality and find some scriptures that might help. But as you've seen, all the scriptures we looked on every side have some ambiguity in some points. The bottom line is we're all sinners. And we do know that sin is universal in the human race. And the only cure for sin is the blood of Jesus, which cleanses from all sin and a relationship with God 
through Christ is the only way that people can have eternal life.